Hi and good evening, everybody. And oh, no microphone on. Great, that's better. Got our uh, microphone on now. Uh, hi and good evening, everybody, and welcome to our How to Repair Pendulum Clocks live stream from sunny york in england and um i see there are some of you there so uh, please feel free to use the live chat i'll try to keep a hang on that for those of you who are new here this evening to get a bit of camera focus there new here, new here this evening then no way that's better um what we've been doing for the past few months is working on this uh, 18th century, early 19th century European tall case clock, which was donated to us by somebody, a local uh, person. And we know that this clock has lived most of its life in this town, um, but for the past 30 years or so has been kind of a little bit abandoned. So we're very slowly working through repairs. And of course, um, as much as these repairs may or may not be, uh, sorry, um, these repairs, of course, are really quite widely applicable, all the techniques, all the thinking as well. So um, here we go. So last week, uh, in fact, the past couple of weeks or so, we've been working on the escapement. Now, um, a few of you have uh, talked to us on YouTube and um, said matthew can you go over the escapement internal drop external drop all that kind of stuff so i've done it a few times which is absolutely fine so what i'm going to do is uh do it as a standalone video on our youtube channel just talking about the terminology of the escapement i'll just get my pointy stick pointy stick and um so what we did to reduce drop that's free angular rotation of the escape wheel we uh, put a piece of metal on here a bit of hardened uh tool steel hi dick sound is distorted ah right okay that could be our uh bandwidth i'll just try turning that off and turning it back on again we've got quite a lot of um we've got quite a lot of demands on our uh internet here at the moment but it'll quieten down in um in a bit Maybe that will help. I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, as I said, hopefully the uh, the bandwidth situation will improve as we go along. I'll try and speak a bit slower. So, um, hi, Derek. So, yeah, we've been working on the escapement, and we've spent a lot, a lot of time on it because um, with these kind of earlier clocks in particular and uh, more modern clocks, you know, getting the escapement right, whatever that means, is um, is really important. So um, uh, we, we've done that. We fitted a piece of steel to reduce drop, and then we hardened and tempered it. And uh, as you can see now, I was left with a bit, a bit of work to do. Last week, but I've gotten it all working. I had to. I did cheat a little bit um, by. Uh, I still need to remove a little bit of material from that entry pallet face. Um, but you, if you look at, back at the video, back at the archive of these events, then you will see. Um, you'll see uh, what we've done, the process, and the thinking behind getting the escapement right. So what I said we'd do. Hi, Jeremy is uh, we would try and get the clock ticking try and get the going train at least there we go try and get the going train up and running and we're going to maybe do that this evening uh all being well 
um, and just we'll start working again on the uh, striking train uh, either later this week or next week or something. There's a bit of a kind of psychological boost. We've qu done quite a bit on this coin train, including repivoting the centre wheel back pivot. Uh, hi, Ian. Uh, yeah, it could be that we're very squidged for uh, bandwidth here uh, tonight, so not a lot I can do. Oh, that's okay. Not a lot I can do about that, I'm afraid, but as I said, it might uh, settle down as we go along when we've got a bit less uh, demand on it. So, as always, please um, ask any questions, and I'll keep my eye on the, on the live chat. So, okay, so last week what we did was we got our um the top block of the pendulum so uh this component in fact interacts let's get our crutch back here with the crutch which we repaired by silver soldering and that, that feeds up that direction and then energy from the escapement is transmitted or uh down the crutch or the leader and then it's imparted to the pendulum. Now, as is often the case, the suspension spring, there it is, uh, was broken and missing effectively. So I'll get some tweezers. So just zoom in a bit. This part here was uh, located inside the top of the block there, which has kind of all been remade anyway. There's quite a lot of soft solder on it around here. I did notice it was cracking, but it seems reasonably uh, strong. Unfortunately, when I was getting a bit annoyed last week and filing away at this rivet, which doesn't need to be riveted, I caught the top block there with my file, so I'm a bit... Uh, um, upset about that, but not to worry, it's done. So there's the top of our suspension spring, and there is the uh, rivet that came out of it. As you can see, it's really sort of uh, like being peened over for who knows, who knows why. Anyway, so we've got new suspension spring here, a bit of old stock, and i um, just going to break a bit off. We can tell because we haven't... Uh, one of the great advantages of uh, not cleaning clocks, as in not refinishing them, is you end up, uh, you maintain or preserve lots of marks and evidence. And we can see here, look, an oily mark where the crutch used to go. So that gives us an indication of um, how long our suspension spring needs to be, which is, which is cool. Um, so if we get our movement frame back again let's try put it that way so you can see and arm myself with a ruler mm. new ruler this week um usually it's one of the mid to tire ones which are really great because they're nice gauge this one is uh, very thin which can be useful um a good bit of steel again it looks like it's had somebody's name on it it's got been ground away so more stolen tools not that i advocate stealing tools of course uh in this american uh make really nice little six inch rule anyway don't know what make it is uh, it doesn't seem to have um a maker's name on it which is a bit weird uh maybe Hmm, I don't know, maybe that was the maker's name under there and for some reason somebody ground it away. Or maybe this stuff was, um, I don't know, it's the same in the States, but in England you still find a lot of uh, Second World War tools because there were obviously a lot of uh, demands on making things and repairing things. And uh, so maybe there was some kind of um, army or military type mark there. In England we have the broad arrow, which is a, like a or crow's foot, I don't know what they have in the States, no doubt. Uh, is it John's? Is it John's ruler? No, it's not John's ruler. 
And I remember today also, John's got my lathe, my Pultra lathe. So um, I'm going to hold the vice to ransom. Uh, don't know. Uh, it might be another John's brand. <laughs> it might be. Yeah, stolen tools. Anyway, it's um, so there's the first question. What is the American equivalent of the crow's foot uh, or the broad arrow for tools that were handed out to the military? Or in fact, um, yeah, where, wherever you're from, that would be kind of cool. Anyhow, uh, it looks like could go on about the rule that it's, for some reason it's been used for something else. It's been heated up or something as well. Whatever. Right. So uh, tools are more interesting than the job, of course. Oh, hi, Jane. Thank you for joining us. Good to see you. So a spring, the uh, active or working length of the spring is about an inch and a quarter. Uh, that bit is an inch and a half. So we actually need about two inches or maybe a little bit more two and a quarter inches all together and then we'll shorten it a bit at the end but before i forget let's just do that so here's our spring steel and let's just snap a bit off there like that and you can see when i brutally snapped it off it actually curls the end around a little bit so let's look at the other end um still curved around a bit so one of those ends needs flattening out get our lock and these um mentioned it before these bench blocks uh are really great hardened and tempered steel really useful really nice i was looking for my um more American tools, looking for my hammer last week or the week before, couldn't find it, and it had gotten into the wrong drawer. So, there we are, just straighten out the end of the spring a little bit. Actually, do it in there. Uh, going to um, lose this anyway, but that's just so it slots into the uh, into the top block. Cool. Right. Let's go back to our um, movement and back cock. And you remember last week I pointed out that um, if you can see about here somewhere there, that bit has been filed away later. It's actually, if you look at the side, where are we? There we are. It's uh, kind of got all sorts of steps in it. I'm not going to make that part up again. Um, it means that we've got a little bit more sort of flexibility where the pendulum hangs. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make our top block of our suspension spring uh, the same width as the bit of the spring itself. So the spring's going to go in there like that. And uh, yeah, it could move up and down a little bit, but of course, once the pendulum's on, it won't move anywhere. It will stay perfectly still. So when you buy those commercial um, uh, suspension springs, they've um, sometimes, and for a little drawing, they've sometimes gotten to, uh, a two pieces of uh, brass like this with holes in them so oh, like cartoon, cartoon eyes and um there's a spring like that and uh, they're riveted together now that's quite cool what i think we established last week is that whatever however you do the top block um I mean, make sure you didn't think that spring was on two-dimensional heaven forbid um when we do the top block it's got to be curved at the bottom this is the top block of the suspension spring irrespective of how the back cock is shaped don't be tempted to make the top block fit it needs to be curved 
So the suspension spring and the uh, pendulum can assume the vertical under the influence of, uh, of gravity. So pleased as I am with my drawing, let's just put a center line through there. Like that. Um, so that all gets riveted together. So could do it that way. I don't have any quarter inch diameter rod and I don't really have a lathe for parting it off. So I'm not going to go down that road. But I will do again a standalone video, which this the list of standalone videos is incredibly long. So the other two ways of doing this, uh, one which we've all seen is just three ways, many ways, I put a pin through. But uh, one is obviously to get uh, a block of material um whatever it is like this and saw it so to saw a slot like that uh drill a hole put a pin through radius this at the bottom like that something like that and then put our spring in so that would be down there and that makes sure there we go um which is also quite uh nice and maybe if you had a super posh clock that would be the way you would do it um one thing you can do with with this method um is to extend this a bit not extend it but use a bigger piece of material and then when you make the top block actually cut away like that the sides which means that when you can to get hold of the pendulum, you can hold it and lift it up, which is quite nice. Or if you're really fancy, you can do all sorts of chamfering on the top and try and make it look old, uh, which I'm not going to do. Now, um, for that job, um, there's a whole lot of thinking, um, of which I'm not particularly part of, but what's new, um, that you would use something like this material, which is cast yellow brass. You can see I practiced a bit of uh, scraping on there. Are you leaving the rust on the escape wheel, Arba? No, I'm going to... Um, oh, hi, Vicky, as well. Uh, no, I'm going to do some more cleaning. I just did some preliminary cleaning, but I'll get some of that off with some more steel wool and a bit of uh, microcrystalline wax on there. I'm certainly not going to kind of try and refinish it, but yeah, I'll stabilise that rust. It's just that was a preliminary, preliminary um, sort of washing just to get us off the starting line. Um, Derek, so yes, yes and no. Um, so I, it could be quite a nice idea to make your top block out of a bit of cast brass. I'm not going to do that here. I might do it in this video that may never happen. But I just thought I'd show you a top tip for sewing a neat slot in there um, because I've been caught out by this many, many, many times. And um, so if you imagine... Oh, gosh, in a move for drawing tonight. That's, that's um, a kind of, uh, what I call it, distraction from actually doing any actual work. So where you've got your block, uh, again, maybe I didn't do enough drawing last week. So here's our block, and we want a neat slot in there. If you've got a lathe and some very fine uh, slitting saws, then, yeah, you can line that up there and do it but if you like me you've got a jeweler saw or a piercing saw then as tempting as it is to get the saw here and kind of with your tongue sort of sticking out at the side try and saw down what will happen and you see this on some back cocks and some suspension springs as well uh hi jim hi rachel good nice lovely to see you all um is uh, that the line will go wiggly and probably wander off like that. Or you saw at this side, you think it looks great until you turn it round and find it's gone wobbly on the other side. So the way to do it, um, to make it neater, is to um, is to saw a small mark Starting uh, with your saw here, and saw a small mark across like that. So don't begin to saw down. Then rearrange the block, and so you get your piercing saw, and you make a mark along here, and then make a mark along here as well. And then slowly join up the dots. I can do a bit of a demonstration, I think. 
Um, because it's quite useful. So if you've ever wondered how those clock people used to get these things so nice and neat, uh, do it in three stages. So so along, so along, so across. Then um, what tends to happen is it kind of goes something like this in the middle, and then eventually it joins up. And it's reasonably neat, um, reasonably neat. So, but more exciting than that, when I was looking for um, my cast brass block, and yeah, I know there's a bit of a um, kind of understandable obsession about using cast brass, really nice material. Um, you have to harden it if you're making wheels and things or bushes, really useful for making the equivalent of um, <laughs> uh, oh dear. I don't know whether that's Derek that shattered or Rachel that shattered. Well, Rachel has been working incredibly hard. But I think it's probably too. Um, it seems to be that kind of time of year, doesn't it? Everybody needs a holiday, maybe. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, this is really good for making those um, uh, barrel arbor bushes and things and for making wedges to support barrel arbor a whole set of one. Um, in place of those things called top hat or um, or uh, barrel arbor bushes, because they tend to be made out of material that's pretty dubious and it wears incredibly rapidly. Having finally today sent off the bushing and depth thing, what chapter thing I've been working on, we've been working on, John and I. Oh gosh, anyway. Um, so, so along like this. And seen by this, so across and so along like that, and then get those uh, things to join up. So, speaking of John's vice, here's John's vice. So, say we want to fit, which I'm not going to do, uh, this spring in there. As I said, as tempting as it is to get your piercing saw the blade is sharp or not can't see anyway so it doesn't matter and go like this and saw the whole way down it's really difficult to get it to uh, saw flat the other thing of course is to leave the stock material oversized we'll see this when we drill later um oh hi sam good to see you um we thought that you'd uh, forgotten us abandoned us no we didn't really um yeah sam will have something today to say about the use of cast brass and so-called proper materials when uh, restoring clocks. I mean, I'm pretty ambivalent about it. Uh, yeah, kind of not exactly been there and done it, but um, it's great to have options, I think. So when you start sewing, just get your saw on one side like that. Make sure the saw blade's nice and tight. Right, okay. Another top tip, my best East Yorkshire accent there for some reason. Um, you want to saw, uh, who was it? Uh, a couple of people have been working on clocks with verge escapements. Let's just turn that down a bit there. Camera's a bit hot today. Um, making verge escapements. When you're making pallets of verge escapements, it's useful. If you imagine you're sawing with your piercing saw, obviously in the middle of it, so the blade bends up like that, it's going to be less sawn than the edges. So what you can do like this, you want the thing to saw evenly, deeply. Put your tweezers or a bit of brass on there and use that to push down and actually pull up on the blade and then you'll end up with a nice uh, even depth slot. There we are, toptip.com. And then we're not going to saw the whole way down. In fact, we're not going to saw this at all because I've got a much more exciting material to make this out of than old cast brass or even modern cast brass. So if you saw along, you maybe don't want that mark to go the whole way along. So again, put your tweezers on or any old bit of brass. And then that will push the blade down so you don't have to um, make a really long mark. I bet uh, uh, Ian has got um, 
circular saw blades for his lathe, which are great, really, really useful. Um, circular saw blades are so cool because when you're making those kind of escape wheels that need two cuts, rather than making some fancy shape cutter, you can normally hack most of the material out that way. So I really should concentrate more on this. Yeah, if you've, um, I mean, it's probably self-evident, uh, but it was just one of those things that I always wondered when you see these um, back cocks and things, where, wherever it is, there it is. I mean, that one's pretty straight, how they got them so straight and so thin. And if you want to get it thinner, you might think, I want a slot that's thinner than my blade. Start with oversized material again, get your um, slot made, and then just forge it down on a piece of the material you want it to, to fit if you're doing new making, uh, like on a French cloth where you've got some very thin slots. Um, if you haven't got a blade thin enough, start with a thicker blade slightly and then forge the material down and then take material off. Uh, so I'm going to saw down from that corner now, like that. So already, I don't know if you can see that, try and get it in there, in or out of the light. It looks really smart. And of course, with this, that's kind of half the battle. So now what I would do, uh, and I don't need to go through the whole process, is to saw down a bit and then turn it round and saw round a bit. And by doing that, you'll end up with something really neat. And again, if you've left your material oversized, you can get rid of this little bit of overspill here when you file it down. So um, there we are. Little tip for, see that there? It looks really, really smart. Whereas if you saw down, you'll never get it that smart. Anyway, good. So that's done with the cast brass because... Uh, when I was looking for materials, I found or remembered um, this stuff, which is like 10 times cooler, uh, Tufnol, um, which is, the, in this case, it's uh, phenolic resin impregnated paper. And I looked at my um, many, many tools on the go already. Um, up to my crutch and saw that the tough knoll is like a perfect fit. So I love this material. I've made all sorts out of it. You'll find it in industry. They make wheels out of it because it's got good anti-friction, um, uh, good anti-friction properties. And if you own a MyFoot lathe, if you look in the end of the MyFoot lathe, there are some tumbler gears in there that are made out of this material. Um, so if you if the thing jams up, the teeth just fall off those wheels rather than uh, break more expensive parts of the lathe. So really like this, it's a, a great material. And what I would do and might still do is to make that top block out of this. And I say, why not? The only slight hesitation I've got is um, I think in some uh, more humid environments, you do get some electrolytic uh, corrosion with this. And if you've ever owned or looked inside um, electromagnetic uh, pendulum clocks like the Gents and all that kind of stuff, you'll see this kind of material. Um, and uh, I think it's really cool. So I personally, for this project, would make it out of that. It'll take a fraction of the time. And I just think it's cool to use something a bit different. And it's obvious as well. Um, it's obvious that it's different and new. And I don't mind that at all. Don't mind uh, it being obvious but that's not how we're going to do it we're going to use another method and that's folding over a piece of cz 108 brass you what's the name of that product tufnol t-u-f-n-o-l t-u-f-n-o-l yeah you can see on our scruff up there now in the mirror cz 108 mirror yeah it's um you can get it in um a, a cloth that's impregnated with phenolic resin or that's paper and it's usually called cart brand or will brand or something. It's like a brilliant material. I'd like to make um, everything out of it. It's really good. Is it any good for electronics? Yes, yeah, you. That's what it's where it's used. Ah. Um, that's what it was developed for. I think for its um, dialectic 
properties. Is that the right word? Uh, yeah, really, really nice. Um, okay, so using CZ108, why are we using CZ108, Matthew? Well, you all know now, or locals and regulars know, um, Paxilin, same difference. Uh, I think I think Paxilin and Tufnol are the same thing. Um, Tufnol, is that in Phil, Jane? Yes. Uh, Phil, the celebrity, question of sport. Right. Cricketer. Cricketer? Yeah. <laughs> um, right, okay. I should know more about sport, but I know nothing about it, so I won't even try. Uh, I do have a, there's a horological cricket connection, but I won't tell you that at the moment. Right, okay, where was it? CZ108, we're using CZ108 because we're gonna fold this material and we don't want it to break. CZ108, which is no lead in it, I don't think, has got really good cold working properties, but you'd get now for out or out for now, as they say, and it's also quite sticky to machine it. Uh, work it or file it in our case. So we've um, got another tool coming up. So it's an exciting day for that. So let's get our spring fragment. Lost it already. Um, the slight problem we've got here is this bit of material. If you can see, it's been guillotined. And so uh, there's a, like a bevel on the edge, which we'll need to allow for and get rid of that as well. So we'll have to make it a bit wider. Now, you want to mark along the edge of many tools on the bench you want to mark along the edge of the bit of material top tip number two use a pair sorry about the condition of these i've just dug them out of the drawer and they are a bit worse for wear so i'll um spend a bit of time on them and clean them up a bit these are starrets so it's american tool day obviously um not my favorite type of odd legs these are called um, hermaphrodite calipers or jenny calipers or odd legs. If you haven't got a pair, go on uh, that famous internet auction site now and get a pair that you can buy and buy more and rights. The ones I prefer, and I used to have some, but they've disappeared. I've got a step in here and you'll see why. But these are really cool because you can mark along the edge of a piece of material with a parallel line. I haven't actually set those to the right widths, which is a bit lax, isn't it? It's a bit narrow, sorry, concentrate. So you um, measure up with your, so this is, I think this is quarter of an inch, isn't it? Yes, it's quarter of an inch, but we're gonna fold it and we wanna get rid of that, um, uh, what do they call it, um, guillotined edge and uh, square the whole thing up. So I'm going to make it a bit wider. So let's make it maybe 10 mil is a bit over the top. See if I can get away making it about eight millimeters. So I'm mixing my imperial and metric like that. And we want the whole thing at the top of the suspension to be quite long. Uh, why not? um let's make it crazy let's go crazy make it 20 mil so let's cut two inches off because we need to fold it over again sorry more um more mixing our so let's call it 50 mil there and let's get sewing so i think it's time for um can't really do it in john's vice might have to go for uh the other vice um, thinking, thinking, thinking whether it's worth repositioning the camera just to see a bit of sewing, which you've all kind of seen many times. Yeah, let's just everything might go blank in a minute so we want to share screen come on brain
probably we're going to um i can feel the background now scruffy background on not why okay a quick rearrange of things Anybody know of the piercing cell table? Not at all sure that was <laughs> worth all the faff, but anyway, there we go. Let's see if it's worked. Right. So let's just quickly saw that. Make sure you can actually. At least I hope I saw through my finger now to make it worth my while moving the camera. <laughs> There's a bit of grass and uh, just going to tidy it up a little bit. First, um, deburr it, get the uh, edges off because, as I said, it's um, yeah, as I said, very sticky material, so the, the uh, swarf doesn't tend to sort of fall off in grains like it does with leaded brass. So, just a bit of a deburr there with a a red file could use sandpaper. Joke. Oh, good. Glad you enjoyed the sound. The microphone's working. Remember to turn the microphone on this week. Oh, I forgot it's got um, sticky back plastic. Um, Sam, Sam's talking about metric and imperial. Oh, yeah. In pre war clock books, and things were metric. Um, but 
I think Derek makes a good point. Uh, I think it's Derek. Uh, he's there to defend himself. Um, that um, the continental measurements came from and uh, to things like BA, British Association, which is actually based on a metric system. So it's not a surprise. I mean, which um, for threads and things, I think that probably makes a whole lot of sense. If BA were basing their uh, system on uh, on a metric standard, then that kind of makes sense. Yeah. So it's probably pretty misleading for me to use both. I grew up with um, metric and then when I got into clocks, uh, of course, one of the really annoying things, um, the many, many annoying things when I was a student was people talking in six and seven eights. So eventually I vowed to learn that myself and then it's become a bit of a disease and now I so I've used both. Right, D bird then, so I just got the, uh, the, the birds off it. Let's just measure halfway-ish. Yeah, I um, I should put my nerdy voice on now. Um, interesting fact about um, the millimeter or the meter that it didn't used to be a direct, um, you know, it's twenty five point four millimeters in an inch. Um, it wasn't didn't always uh, wasn't always twenty five point four, and they changed it in the nineteen fifties, I think, to make it easier to uh, convert between the two. Right, I've got no idea whether I'm doing this right because like zero concentration. What's, what's new there? Let's get our square, engineer square. Check that's reasonably square there. And this is where hopefully it doesn't break off. We're going to continue to fold that around on itself. Might actually just squash it in the vise. But what we want to do before we fold it in on itself is to put the material in there. Otherwise, it might be too tight and we cannot get it in the slot. So let's just put... Well, I don't have to quite do it yet. Maybe we can just do it by hand. Yeah, there we are. Right. Okay, get rid of that. Bigger hammer needed. Bigger hammer. Put our spring inside. And let's just whack that down. There we go. Um, so it's finished. That's it. No, another joke. Two jokes in one night. So you can see uh, why we put a bit of suspension spring in there because it's actually really tight already and we would not be able to get it out otherwise. So the next thing I'm going to do is, uh, maybe I should have left that in there, not to worry, is to um, might just tidy up the sides a bit, but not particularly just. But uh, let's just very very quick tidy up here i won't squeeze it here otherwise it'll it'll close up that gap the reason i left it oversized is when because i'm going to drill holes i think i was trying to say this before but got distracted when you drill holes it's always best to drill the hole first and then bring the work to uh, make that hole look in the right place. If you make the work to size, then drill a hole, it's just inevitable that the hole will not be in the right place and your work will be ruined. Right, there we go. So uh, let's just mark our centre line. And again here, that's where your odd legs are really, really useful. 
Um, I haven't chucked them away. So we can measure up. It's about seven and a half millimeters now, filed it down. Let's just set our caliper. Uh, when you're measuring, um, I know uh, many of you, this will be old news, but to new uh, starters, something like this, don't try and measure from the end of the ruler because it's almost impossible to get those two things lined up. Always measure from like 10 there. It's much easier to get a visual on it. But then, of course, you've got to remember to um, not 10 off your uh, uh, value. So again, we can just use these calipers that are, again, not very sharp to come out of the draw today. But if we want to find the middle, for instance, we just scribe a little line down there, turn it round, scribe a line down there again. We can uh, take the average of those two lines because they won't be quite on top of one another, I don't think. Well, they're pretty close. And we can put our marks there. So I'm going to make two... Uh, drill holes in this. I haven't thought quite I'm going to drill. It's probably going to be a bit of a, a pig to drill. But I'm going to put two rivets in. So the spring and the bit of brass like that are actually connected. Um, sometimes you see it with one. I think that looks a bit scruffy when the top can kind of pivot round. So I'm going to use two uh, rivets through there. And um, I'm going to then punch holes in the uh, suspension spring and uh, rivet the whole thing up with brass rivets or steel rivets doesn't really matter and i'm going to make this end rounded um if i don't run out of time which i will do then we can punch a hole in this end and we've got our suspension spring done um right okay let's get a center punch really matter where these rivets go let's just have a think about how long we want this to be so it doesn't look completely crazy let's say we'll have it that long we'll have a rivet there and we'll have a rivet there mm. what could possibly go wrong right our center punch That uh, little tap. Same thing there. And we will drill that. Now I'm going to have to use the old uh, hand drill, I think. Well, I will, because otherwise it's with the Archimedean drill or nothing. If we've got a drill that's even remotely sharp. Uh, when you're drilling, if you've got if you're drilling on um a drill press, you know, like a bench drilling machine, as any half sensible person would do, then CZ108 is really terrible for grabbing. So make sure that the work is clamped, otherwise you will end up um end up in difficulties with it. Just sharpen that drill up a bit. want to use so all i'm doing here is just uh, remember we talked before about removing the um some of the sort of helix angle from the drill just doing it in a slightly different way 
here, just kind of making a spade drill out of an old twist drill. It'd be interesting to see if it's even remotely sharp or not. Just going to uh, do that a little bit more. Again, the thinner the kind of web or the thickness of the drill, the better it's going to drill. And here, unlike drilling our pivot a few weeks ago, uh, the drill isn't going to break. It might, it'll stick in the hole if it's if the drill's too, the helix angle's too great. Hence, so I'm effectively um, making a sort of twist drill into a bit of a spade drill. Just a old drill that I've got and getting the the web nice and thin so now it won't grab now whether it drills or not is a anybody's idea anybody's guess away so just get that clamped in john's vice as i said if you're drilling with a drilling machine then make sure that this is really well uh, clamped down as it can cause an accident. Didn't you promise them some ticking this evening? Yeah, 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 ticking. But I'll tell you what, if um, <laughs> you might have the pendulum on at this rate, I forgot to tell you this is a marathon eight and a half hour long session. <laughs> Hence the ticking. Sam's so saying to hurry up. It's even more exciting than that because I've um, made a test stand. How's the sound effect? I have to stop talking now and get working, given that Sam's put there. And Ian, it better be ticking because he's missed his tea to attend this. Oh, no. <laughs> Everybody's in the doghouse. I'm in the doghouse. I'm in the dog doghouse because it's not ticking. Right, okay, I get it. Right, well, there's one hole drilled, surprisingly, uh, using the term successfully pretty loosely. Right. I've got 35 minutes. My can run the risk of actually concentrating. Don't think that's going to happen, but... Right. Good. Well, there you go. Miracle. Got an hour. Hole through. And of course, that'll have thrown up burrs on the inside. So it can knock those burrs off. Holes are a bit big, I'm afraid, but not to worry. We'll have to just punch bigger holes in our spring. So we can kind of cut down with our spring, there we are, to chop the burrs off on the inside. Top tip 66. Good. Right, there we are. So the next thing to do, because do to really decide which is which side of this thing. So let's just uh, mark on. That's the side where the spring curves up at the bottom. I was springing, better actually check that it's going to be long enough. Yeah. Uh, line it up 
ish with the middle and then get um, a brooch. a couple of marks where we want to punch the spring at the end of the brooch. And just about see those. Do you see those little marks in there? If it would focus. Yeah. And then a uh, sticking set. Uh, no, I saw the sticking tool earlier. Still hasn't made its way back since last time. Okay, let's find a punch with a decent big end on it because the uh, holes are quite big in the bit of metal. That should do it. Get to that. Line our punch up with a hole in the anvil that's ever so fractionally larger than the steak. Just want it to neatly punch out two holes. It's lined up. Something like that. And there we go. First hole. Uh, and second one. Our camera doesn't seem to have recovered from being moved around anyway. Tap. Don't uh, whack it too much, otherwise you'll split the spring. There we go. All good. Just going to flatten that out a little bit. Just to knock down those furs from the uh, punching process. And then as much as it's easy to leave that scruffy inside the thing, it doesn't really matter. Um, just going to use the old uh, Arkansas stone to stone it down a little bit, just to stone off the edges there. Be great if you put the spring in there and it's all sort of um, rough. A little bit, but this is there's so much kind of tolerance in there. Um, that uh, the thing is with this, as long as the holes are bigger than the hole in the uh, the brass, as, once it's riveted, it'll be it'll be fine. So just going to got the spring end there. This is the upper end. Just gonna turn it flat. 
the end where I snapped it off and then just pulling off the corners. Nobody will ever see it, but it, it just makes it a bit smarter inside there. Right, good. Goes that way around, that goes that way around. Check that the holes actually line up, which they do ish. Yeah, great. You see that? Ta -da. Right, next thing to do then is to, because once we rivet it together, we can't get to this bit anymore. So the next thing to do is just to shape this to that uh, sort of rounded thing. How are we doing for time? Oh, I've got ages, I've got 28 minutes yet. You're going to get a ticket, Matthew. Going to get a ticket? Yeah. I don't know. Are we going to get a ticket? <laughs> got nothing to do with me. I'm just the result of some collective consciousness. Right. Good. Well, you can't say that's not a good fit, mate. It's still got buzz on it, but maybe not too fussed about those yet. Uh, let's just shape uh, the end here. Uh, need to saw it. I would normally put it flat on the piercing saw table. Um, but since we're in such a rush, I'll just uh, cut it by eye. Not bad. Just tidy up a bit. And I'm just slightly conscious of trapping the brass together and we can't get the spring back in. So I'm just going to put the spring back in the slot when I trap it in the vise. Otherwise, we'll run into difficulties later. Radius a bit with a file. This, as I say, will be the last time we can get to this space. Once the spring's in, it's in. Again here, as always, doing our best to keep the thing nice and flat. We don't want stickiness if we can help it. So to that end, now we've got the thing radius like that. Just going to run around with my file to put the graining in the direction of the work. There we are. A little bit rough and ready, but um, that's that. Right, rivets now. Get some brass wire. So as always with our riveting, we want to make the rivets really tight in the first place. That's going to uh, make life so much easier. If the rivets are too small, then uh, you've had it really. Well, you can spread it, but then you start hammering and uh don't want to don't do that you want the rivets to be a good fit in the first place let's see if we've got any slightly smaller metal again the old uh, brass wire is pretty indispensable for all this kind of stuff
any of these is quite where we want to be on diameter. Not bad. Just going to um, put a brooch in those holes to open them up a bit, just to check that they're not burned over with holding it in the vise. Stabbing my finger. Brush on both sides. Yeah, their holes have got kind of burred over. I'm happy with the burrs on there because when I rivet it, they'll kind of just um, evaporate. Check again that that wire is not too small. Yeah, it's good. So get our pin vice. Change the collar. Wires a bit long, a bit crazy long there, but it might do. The problem is when the wire's too long, it kind of vibrates when you're filing it. Can't really. So I might actually cut it in half. Not to waste too much. Cut it. And then we just can file up a couple of rivets. Oxford filing block. Get that on there. Files two. Fine. First thing to do, just file a kind of quite a sharp, sharp point, a bleak point on the end. So, nearly there, a little bit more. I will move back to my fine file now because it's the one there. Too rough. One rivet, actually a bit uh, loose, but it'll do. Second one. Rising tension in the workshop. Expectations for type plans have been made clear. Dear me, gosh. It'll be my appraisal next week. Line manager. I think what else I've got to do now to get the thing ticking. All right, that, that rivet's a lot better. Actually, is still tapered. In fact, I'm going to get rid of that first one. Been rejected. Briefly rejected. I'm doing another one. And what I would say is, as you can see, we kind of used the same tools every week. So that looks as uh, rough as anything, but actually I'm really happy with that. We can get rid of that again. Go back to our bit of spring, if we can find it. One of our rivets. Get the other one out. I'll spring in, curls up that way, that goes on. Of course, I've 
lost the little mark. It's gotten rubbed off, filed off, in fact. Yeah, let's just check our holes. That way, that way. Looks pretty symmetrical, so I'm going to just put them in like that. Right. I'll tell you the um mistake here. Had a tool for the job, then just doing it in the jars of the vice. So with rivets, uh, when we used to, uh, in the old days, making clocks with students, there was, a, again, a bit of an obsession for counter countersinking the rivet like it was sort of some kind of aircraft, uh, again, made in the Second World War. You don't need to do that with clocks. When you rivet, there'll be enough spreading of the uh, material to hold it, like, really tight. If you start countersinking the surface, you'll then find it really difficult to fill that countersink and you end up with a mark. If you wonder how uh, they rivet in clock pillars, for instance, and they're invisible, they um, do that by, can we get that in a hole where it fits in? And that one. They do that by not countersinking it, be totally like, strong enough. counterintuitive maybe so there we go there's our thing nearly ready for finishing so i'm just going to this and so again put them off with about half a millimeter something like that if you want to judge that then get a bit of um material that's half a millimeter thick that what would be really good here is to add a hole in the end which it doesn't of course so yeah uh when uh when you come to making your first clock sam uh remember don't countersink the rivet holes otherwise you'll never get rid of the marks Right, every opportunity here to fall through my finger again. Might just have enough rivet left there to put in the vice. Just about try and sign that direction. It's slightly safer. There we go. So, just got to rivet these down now. They're a bit long, actually. They don't need to be anything like as long as that, but I'll file them down. So, next. Uh, top tool is a little stick, like a silversmithing sort of mushroom top stick. I think it's French. It's got my name engraved on it. Or is it Swiss? I see uh, Tiso, the same as those um, specialist pliers, like sort of like mainspring hole punching pliers. Nice. So we want our little round headed. That down a bit so we can actually just rivet it fully. Just 
Tular lunch. I will like it. Do you like that? Silversmithing steaks. I think so. I always assumed they were for pushing dents out of pocket watch cases. I think they oh, maybe, maybe it is. Maybe it is. Um that's a good point, actually. Yeah, maybe they are. I've seen the boxwood ones for doing that. Um yeah, because this is um maybe yeah, maybe you're right, Sam. But I'm sure you've probably got a heck of a lot better idea than I have. So let's just tidy that up. I've only got files here, but I've got lots of um I'm using a cork block to keep the thing flat. And we don't want it to be rounded. I want the style and the work to stick together. I like those rivet marks. Right. And then let's take off some of that excess material from the sides. It could actually stay there. It doesn't look too bad, but let's just smart up a little bit. Get rid of the marks that we've made and end up draw filing it. So our Final file marks run along the um, focus, run along the edge of the work rather than across it. Same on this side. File marks. And a bit of draw filing. And then what I would do if we had time, we've got 10 minutes, so nearly there. As you can see, it's looking quite smart now. Um, again, just see if I can find a file a bit cleaner. And has a handle on it. I'm going to hold really important thing when you want to file something flat, don't hold it in the vise, put it on your finger, put the vise file on there. Talked about this before, then the two things move together. So uh, let's just. Now, CZ108 is not the most pleasant material to file because it just immediately fills your file with filings, as that has done there. Not bad. It's getting there. You can you see? I'll just move it into the light. Few file marks done in it, but as you can see there, look, the rivets are effectively completely invisible. Let's do a bit on this side. Then the most important part of this process, again, um, please, I know I mentioned this the whole time, avoid wet and dry paper, all that kind of stuff, because um, it's unnecessary. And it just, especially, particularly on old work, on new work, I suppose, we can do what we want. spend much time on it because i've got a whole nine minutes now to get the clock ticking so there's our um suspension unit now the thing i'm really not keen on is the fact that the top is just bent round like that so just going to very quickly file that flat
see this on the back of um, things like bell standards on French clocks where they've been sort of forged round. They don't leave them kind of squidgy. They file the end flat like that and then just file on again in your hand a couple of bevels. The other side. So there we are. You can see that. Looks dead smart now. Well, in my humble opinion. And uh, yeah, pretty much. Well, in fact, they, they are invisible um, rivets. Good. Right. Next thing is to punch a hole in the other end so let's go back to our clock see that's how our yep, spring fits now happy with that Put our, where it needs to be there another hole might need a bit bigger hole this time because the hole in the uh the top block is quite big if you remember from last week so let's just uh move back to our baking set check that's a bit small need a bigger Take a stick, take a punch. Be not a oh, hole that's a particularly good fit there, but anyway, Shorten the screen a little bit. Checking that it's safe. Uh, and I think if I remember correctly, it also needs some material removing to actually get into the uh, into the top block. So I'll just do that. Pair of shears. And you remember when we um, chiseled away some material in the vise? Might actually have to do that again. Quite uh, subtle. Could file it, but it's going to be a bit abusive to the file. So, not that it's not abusive to the chisel as well, but.
Right, there we go. So now we want our um, pin through here. And you remember me uh, banging on about not riveting the pin. Don't rivet the pin. Uh, just put a pin through there. That's a good fit. Yes, use one of our so called universal pins. Yeah, that'll work well. But what we don't want here is a tapered pin. We want this pin to be parallel where it uh, goes through or nearly parallel anyway. So let's just put a bit of a mark. We know where that wants to be. What's some of the questions? Has everybody gone home? No. Um, oh, looking at it ticking. Oh well. Any uh, any week now. I was going to file this pin up a little bit more parallel. I've got my mark there. Just getting the shot a bit more. Um, where I want that to be. So just. They page on the jaws of the uh, pin dice. So I would actually take that out and draw file it because uh, we obviously don't want it to drop out because we're not going to rivet it as I've said 300 times. So in order to make it stick in the hole, just get a three square file and uh, it's probably easier to hold it at that end. Just put on some draw filing uh, like that. Good. So that pin is not going to drop out now, um, but it's not riveted either. So the next person that comes along to work on this clock won't have the difficulty we had last week of having to really struggle with it. So I'm just going to get the piercing saw in. And when you want to saw, something like that and just put the saw against the work begin to saw like a little bit and then push the handle so many tools on the bench in that direction see the blade deflecting and that'll mean that it won't cut the work there we are okay same on the other side you don't want to sort of hack into the work. Okay, after all this we've been through. So a couple of little saw marks and then pull the blade away. And uh, there we go. We've got our bit of um, uh, steel in there. Now what I would do is to get a bit of paper like last week, put that on the file and just see that file that flat so it's not just as sawn there we go so uh not a thing of great beauty but um we've done it uh, so let's look for our pendulum rod. Here it is. Oh, it's an extended version tonight. Yay! 
those people who were meant to be in the dinner hours ago, apologies. So remember, we haven't quite got the bottom end of our pendulum sorted out yet. There we go. Sorry about the filing on there. Um, that's good. Let's get our stand out. You didn't want to see anything, did you? It worked away, wasn't it? Rearrange the camera a bit for a better view. There we go. Hope it's not too incriminating. There's our movement. Still not ready to see a thing. Okay, so spot the deliberate mistake. <laughs> Basically, picking out from the back of the um, the thing. Uh, what we're going to do now is just put some wheels in this, which would help, wouldn't it? Might actually just get rid of that craziness for a second. Got uh, probably a good idea to actually assemble the clock first. Hmm. Interesting. Obvious deliberate mistake. Thank you, everybody, for pointing that out. Right, did I actually? Out the um, I think it did. There we go. That's our train. Try and do it without taking the back cock off, which of course is not the way to do it. If you're watching at home, don't do it this way at home. Fine. A sec. Bit of scrap gut line. Those in there. Bend the end round first. Like that. Hmm. 
Wouldn't normally pick new gut lines without taking the whole thing apart, of course, but uh, there you go. So here's our line. Made a video about this. Um, let's just put a knot in there and double it up so it can't pull through. And then if we get our. Pull the knot nice and tight, like that. And then to break the knot, if you burn it, the um, sorry, this is not very vegan, vegan friendly uh, exercise. If you burn it, the sort of um, material of the gut, the sinews, kind of all bundle up, which is a really great way to stop the knot from pulling through. Push that in there. So sometimes leave the tip, leave the tail on the knot a bit longer than I've done it there. So you push it inside because sometimes it can work its way out and interfere with the uh, interfere with the click. Right, leave the pin in there. Oh, so many super top tips I'm going to tell you about tonight. Um. When you put this pin in to hold the slip washer on, don't cut it off flush for the same reason we've got with the top block of the suspension. Otherwise, um, otherwise the next person finds it nearly impossible to get it out. And also, it mustn't go up the whole way through. Again, sort of move that file away rather nonchalantly. Draw a file. Pop that in there. Brass hammer. Put it off nice and long. Sometimes the um, uh, hammer springs in the way, so you do actually have to cut it quite short. So to protect the thing, normally I'd do it with a bit of paper, but with a bit of a rush. So just file it. The end flat. And then as long as there's nothing um, that's going to catch on the slip washer, then if you really want to be super generous to your next person, you can't see this I'm afraid, but just done that in the visor, squish the end flat so the next person can just get a pair of pliers and uh, Sorted. Oil. Obviously, this is all incredibly temporary just to get it working, but you should oil it nevertheless. So, a bit of oil in there behind the slip washer on that bearing. Couple of drops on the face of the great wheel. Click where it touches the ratchet. Click bearing, and click spring where it touches the click. Okay, let's pop it together. Else is doing the same thing. I think under a complete mountain of tools. You wouldn't norm obviously goes without saying that you wouldn't normally do it like this. You certainly wouldn't have the pallets in and the pallet arbor. Um 
Yeah. Go. Where our pins are. That's on a perfect job tool for the job. To tapping those pins in. Absolutely perfect. A couple of pins in here. Okay, a bit of oil. So, focus. Do with a slightly bigger oiler for this, for these large bearings. Center wheel. It's not going to be running for long, but we do want some oil on there. Never be tempted by the idea of somehow dry running the thing. Doesn't, terrible idea. Or if you do, Make sure that you try dry running your car first without an oil in the crankcase. Take it for a drive up and down the A3 and then, um, then do the center of the clock. Yeah, oil I could do to be a bit bigger. Any audience left? Yes, everyone's still here. It's in England. It's England playing the football at the moment. Not tonight. Just get to sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Where's the lock ticking? Right, needed a big roller. Anyway. Put some oil on, just double check that the oil on the pallets too. Yeah, I know I could get it ticking without any oil on there, but so just put a little bit of oil on the entry pallet and the action of the escapement will walk uh, walk that round. Right, okay. Back to the insanity that is so uh, stand. I'm going to actually do it. So now you can't, I'm sort of peeking around the corner, it looks crazy, doesn't it? Uh, anyway. I'm just... Uh, Unraveling this tortured bit of gut line that we're using. It looks a little bit thin, actually. Um, John, my co-author, was um, asking me about gut line the other day. I get mine from Bull Brand in Kings Lynn, Norfolk. Brilliant company. And you can get whatever thickness you want. Um, the stuff I've got is about between 1.5 and 1.6, uh, which is quite nice, reassuring. It's not going to break. That's through there. Okay. Zoom out as much as we dare. As you can see the um Statement. There we go. So, what do we need now? I 
And we have the uh, rating nut found that miracle. The link. Should oil the pulley. Let's just get that through there. Very quickly do our clocky knot. Half past yet. Oh, no, not yet. <laughs> Lenny. Half past midnight. So very quickly. Yeah. If you can help it, when you're doing um, these uh, butterfly knot, when you're putting lines on long case clocks, please uh, try and avoid bits of dowel, nuts, little bits of brass rod with holes drilled in them. In my humble opinion, just do it like this. Neater than this, of course. Maybe you'll have a little bit more time. Uh, it's just a really nice way of doing it. So I can quite see what you can see. Like that. Right. There's our butterfly knot. That's good. Um, the is this is the actual one for the clock. Not too bad. Remember all those months and years ago when we wrapped up our driving weights neatly, got them all nice and clean. Let's just Good job, I'm not a um, member of any horological institutions, otherwise I would get banned after tonight. But there we go. So, right on, just a test of the stand. And here we have our whoop, pendulum bob. Again, remember that all those months ago that we cleaned it, so it's all ready. Although the pendulum still isn't kind of quite repaired yet properly, but which way around does it go? There's our nice cleaned pendulum bob. It will fall apart. Let's just feed our new spring block up through the crutch. Okay, in there in the back. Oh, you can't quite see that from the can, that's a shame. Just a bit of encouragement. There we are. So it's quite a long way out of beat. As you can see, this pallet is uh, spending far too much time out of the escape wheel. So we're going to lift the frame like that. Or we can bend the crutch. And considering we did all that work on the crutch, so we want to move this pallet further in. Tricky to. There's a way around that, isn't there? There's always a way around these things. Mm -hmm. 
So rather than crazily bending the crutch when <laughs> when we might want to uh, bend it back again and risk breaking something, I'll just use some framing wedges under the seat board just to. And uh, quite a lot of um, So uh, there we are. Um, the statement looks quite sweet. There's still quite a lot of play between the crutch uh, and the, the crutch loop and the block. So I'm going to probably glue on um, a piece of material there uh, at some point in their proceedings. But that's where we wanted to get to. As you can see, um, reasonably confident that our clock is just going to go straight from the off. Obviously, it's not going to do any work yet. It's no striking train or anything there. But um, pretty much our going train is now finished. And that was good uh, with extra long session this evening um, to get it ticking. But very happy with that. Uh, yeah, once a bit more oil on it, it sounds quite um, noisy. That's good. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks for the encouragement. Uh, sorry about the chaos. Uh, <laughs> apologies for that last uh, 10 minutes um, to the poor old clock. And uh, what I always forgot to say is, as always, normally uh, we're wearing my nitrile gloves, but you can see the kinds of um, thing with the camera and the microphone and the computer. It's not actually that practical doing this so quickly. But uh, I hope there's some useful top tips there for this evening. Thanks for following along. Um, very large cup of tea, exactly. Thank you. And uh, super special thank you to Team Open Clock Club, who's, um, so I'm going to sit here now and just watch this and be like super happy with it actually ticking. Um, it is one of those cases, I think, if we hadn't done this, who knows what might have happened to this clock. But, uh, and it just shows that you can get clocks running without cleaning them, without immersing them in. Um, ultrasonic or you name it, uh, you just clean out the bearing holes and they want to run, uh, as you can see here. So all good. I will leave it ticking and say bye for now and see you next week when I might have tied it up or not. Thanks very much. Good night. Thank you.